Hey, hi everybody. My name is Jerry Wise and I'm a life and relationship coach and I have been working to help people to learn to self-differentiate and to find themselves for decades. And this video is entitled, Stop Letting Others Define You. I hope you'll subscribe, like, comment, and join and support this channel so that more free videos can come your way. Don Miguel Ruiz, who wrote the book, The Four Agreements, he says there's a huge amount of freedom that comes to you when you take nothing personally. No one, as I believe, has the responsibility to define you or to define us. No one has that responsibility. That's our responsibility. Ruiz writes further, nothing others do is because of you, and that what others say and do is a projection of their own reality, their own dream. When you are immune to the opinions and actions of others, you won't be the victim of needless suffering. I love that quote. In working on reducing uh, how uh, allowing others to define us, we want to and must remember we are not a label, we're not a role, we are not a demeaning statement, and we are not a put down. And it's helpful if we can begin to practice countering these things and countering these statements. And in my own case, I use an invisible filter, and it's a mental filter, to filter out high praise and to filter out negative labeling. When someone says something negative about me, I realize they are talking about their experience, not mine. And I think that's very important to remember that when someone says something negative and is being critical or mean in that way, they're talking about their own experience. They're, they just happen to use your name and are talking to you. For example, I've had some people on the, you know, there are a couple of people who mentioned, uh, well, on YouTube comments, for example, and they say, well, Jerry, you're just blaming the victim. And I've been working with victims of trauma and abuse and, and problems and marital difficulties for decades. And I don't blame victims. I understand victims have been victimized. So they're not talking about me. They're talking about what they fear someone may be doing, and they often may not listen carefully to what someone's saying. The, uh, and also, there are many ways to look at a problem, and you can look at it different ways and not, and not intend or choose or be doing the blaming of a victim. Another thing to remember in not letting others define you Stop absorbing, or as Ross Rosenberg says, observe, don't absorb. And I use that a lot with lots of people. And with myself, I want to learn to, ob to observe and not to absorb. Observing is up here, absorbing is down here. And I want to use my mental capacity when someone's talking to me or trying to define me. I have also used a tool uh, called Coca-Cola in which when someone says something crazy or some, it, it makes no sense to me what they're saying about me or to me, I think of it as being them calling me a Coca-Cola. Well, how, how rational is, is it that I'm a Coca-Cola? I, I know I'm not a Coca-Cola. Why should I feel hurt because someone called me a Coca-Cola? Uh, and so I then reduce the amount of unnecessary suffering and the hurt from what they're saying because I'm saying, well, there they go, calling me a Coca-Cola again. 
because uh, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, and it's not who I am. Again, back to the beginning, it's about them. It's not about me. It's important that we trust our gut and trust our feelings. But when our gut is filling uh, with our family of origin, then we want to work on those messages and emotional experiences that we are having. We need to get a coach, get a therapist, get in a support group so that we can work on those triggering emotions that are inside of us. If I've always felt I was worthless and then somebody calls me worthless, which is of course like calling me a Coca-Cola, uh, because it's totally untrue and, and really has nothing to do with reality, um, it triggers a feeling of worthlessness in me. So when those things happen, when those systems feelings happen, then I want to go get some help to get that feeling out of me. I'm not going to take their feeling in me. I'm going to work on my feeling in which their statement triggers me. Uh, because their statement is saying, well, you're a Coca-Cola. And then I go cry for an hour because someone called me a Coca-Cola. That's really kind of irrational. Now, if I felt worthless, then I want to go work on feeling worth uh, my feelings of worthlessness, which are, again, negative messages, not true messages, not real messages. They were imprinted or they might have been promoted by my family of origin, but they're not true. They're what I've learned. Well, if we've learned them, we can unlearn them. And that's the good news. I also think it's important that we see the anxiety in others. When you're being defined by someone else, generally their anxiety, often systems anxiety, but their anxiety has been triggered. And that's why they're needing or wanting to define you. <clears throat> start looking to other people's anxiety and stop. start observing that. I remember I had a boss, and, and again, uh, she was relatively immature, not a bad person, but just immature. And, and she had grown up with some abuse and had some abusive relationships. And at that time, I was the only male in the department. Uh, and And when she would make comments to me, like, well, I'm just going to have to watch you more carefully. And I'm kind of going, you know, everybody's kind of going, well, Jerry's kind of the most full of integrity kind of employee we have. I mean, why has he got to be watched? Because she was dealing with her own anxiety. And I also noticed that her anxiety was triggered when she would say things like that. That would help me to calm down if I could understand her anxiety has been triggered then I know to watch out for what's going to be said and not take it to heart and not take it as a real critique. One of the primary ways to reduce absorption, and I said observe, don't absorb. One of the primary ways to reduce absorption is to protect, excuse me, is to practice reducing your anxiety, working to stay calm, Stay in your head if necessary and avoid as much as possible the overwhelming feelings. This takes practice. I understand that. Everything I teach and everything I talk about are things I have had to go through, endure, learn, and I still am learning them. I haven't arrived. I'm still learning these things. Um, we may still feel anxious but focus on your thinking process. Uh, just because I'm anxious doesn't mean I can't try to work on think on focusing on my thinking process. What they're saying, they're highly anxious and triggered. They're saying these things to define me, and I must not take them as serious. Um, and that they are not... Uh, they are not truly a definition of me. They are coming out of their anxiety. Ch 
check how you view yourself, how you define you. Are you a good person? Do you believe you're a good person? Do you believe you're a loving person, a caring person, a generous person? A, you know, I didn't say, are you a perfectly good person? I didn't say you are a perfectly generous person. I'm saying, in general, are you a good person? Do you see yourself as being a good person? Um, and defining ourselves as, I am a good person, flawed, but good. So we want to work on how we view ourselves. The Inner Bonding book by Margaret, Margaret Paul is a place to start. No Bad Parts by Richard Schwartz is another place to learn about accepting yourself. And then If You Meet My Family, You'd Understand by Jack Shatama. S-H-I-T-A-M-A. And those might be some beginning places you can learn to accept and love yourself more. And, and people say, well, how do I learn to love myself? Do you know what I tell them? It, it's not a how question. It's a when question. It, it's like me asking you, how do I breathe? And I'm holding my breath. It's not a how question, it's a when. When you open your mouth and breathe, that's when you'll breathe and learn to breathe. And same way with loving yourself. There's not five techniques that that tell you how to do that. There are things that, that might be um, fruits of that or evidence of you loving yourself, but loving yourself is a choice. Loving you is a choice whenever you're ready to make it. Whenever you're ready to do that. Now, you might fall back and not be loving yourself as much. Then you choose again. And we keep choosing and keep choosing, especially if we grew up in a dysfunctional family where we didn't feel loved. Now you're the parent for you as an adult. Not your family of origin, but you. Always remember when others are trying to define you. Always remember they don't know you like you know you. They don't know you like you know you. In fact, nobody knows you like you know you. No one has fully walked in your shoes for the last many decades. And we always tend to think people can just know us. Uh, and there are many times that people will come in, and when, when I was in uh, practice um, in marriage and family therapy, they would come in, and they would think, I have x-ray vision, or I can I can know them better than they know themselves. And it's kind of like, gosh, that's, that's a superpower I don't have. Now, certainly I've learned some things. I can take some cues and kind of get some uh, get some ideas, but I, I, I'm not in somebody's body. I don't know them. They've been with themselves for a long time. And and so I want to be real careful about, uh, you know, what I say, what judgments I make, what conclusions I come to. I want to have them participating in that rather than me defining them. Uh, oh, I can just tell you're a mean person. You know, well, I, I don't know. I haven't, I don't know all that's going on inside of them. Maybe they're a traumatized person not a mean person. They're mean on the outside, traumatized on the inside. No one has fully walked in your shoes. So when people go to define you, always remember, I hear what you're saying, but that's not me. And that's not all of me. And in fact, I'm not even sure it's any of me. <clears throat> And then I've had, you know, people will say, um, you know, we'll get a, let's say we have a situation in which we get triggered and then we avoid. And then you'll be blamed or labeled or criticized or defined as, well, you're just an avoider. No, I'm not an avoider. That is what I use when I get triggered and I am in a survival mode 
or I don't know how to handle it any other way. That's different than I am just an avoider. So others don't know. They just see a snippet of your behavior and then want to define you. Don't accept that. Blaming is a form of defining others. We want to avoid blaming others. We want to ignore the blaming we get as well. And that blaming is often an emotional triangle between the other person, an issue they're having, and you. And you get pulled into by being the cause or the blame for this. And blaming is a form of defining of you. And I want to reject that. Someone clearly can talk to me out of concern or desire to, hey, Jerry, you had done something that hurt my feelings. You know, I just, but that's them talking about them. And then I realize, you know, I think I did hurt their feelings. You know, that wasn't a very kind thing to say. Um, versus being blamed. Uh, because again, everyone wants to blame others for their feelings, their actions. Um, and I want to learn to begin to reject that and reject that notion. Well, you're just hurting me. No, I may be doing something that's triggering your hurt, but I'm not trying to hurt you. You know, that's, I want to have that clarity and that takes a while to learn that. Shoulds. That's another way of, uh, shoulds are a way of defining you again, others defining you. Push back. These are shaming statements, or at the very least intrusive statements, and not respectful of your boundaries. When someone said you should have done X, Y, and Z, no, wait, wait, that's, you know, you're not my parent. Uh, you're, you're not a judge in a court of law. You're not, you're another human being just like I am. And shoulds don't feel good. And shoulds are shaming. Because that meant you messed up. You should have done this. Well, that's, uh, you know, that's not helpful and it's not accurate in terms of defining you. And like so many others, I like to change shoulds into coulds. And maybe I could say if someone's trying to define me, uh, you should have done this. Well, uh, I guess, Uncle Bob, I guess I can count on you to say how you really feel. Um, and or I remember somebody saying, well, Jerry, you're just fat. I go, well, I guess I can count on you to say how you really feel about me. Um, and again, kind of mean, insensitive, inappropriate. And, uh, well, you should have lost weight. Uh, well, I, I could have. Uh, I, and the choices I make at the time are based on what I'm feeling, what I'm thinking, what my experience is. Uh, you know, I'm glad you had it all, my life all cleared, all uh, lined out for me. Uh, and, and of course, many times, you know, you just go, duh. You know, you, you should have lost weight, Jerry. Duh. I mean, what, what's the purpose of you saying that? You know, other than to define me. Uh, and I even had, there's even, there were even a couple of people on YouTube back when I weighed more than I weigh now. And they would say, well, I can't listen to someone whose weight is so out of control. And if you're that heavy, then you've got a lot more problems than I have. And I can't listen to your videos. Well, that's interesting. Um, and of course, I would say there are plenty of other YouTube channels that you can listen to. Uh, and be careful about your judgments. It could put you in peril because you may not know everything. There are those who say, well, you should have studied business rather than art in college. Well, I could have, 
but I chose not to. You sh Jerry, you should have made this video much shorter. It was too long. Well, I could have, but length is my strength. Or a Mark Twain response, which is, or I'm too lazy to make it shorter. I'm not going to let somebody define me. I'm open to other people's critiques if it is for my well-being and caring for me, but not someone who's blaming and shaming. That's not, that's to define me. Shaming and blaming is about defining you. Remember where you end and they begin. Stay on your side of the tennis net. Keep them out of your side of the tennis court. And keep the emotional net between you and them up. And that's appropriate. And that so many times we want to jump over and be in someone else's life or jump over and they got to be in your life, telling you how to dress and look and what job to have and what color your hair should be and what, uh, you know, and that in my case, mom would say, when you're going to get a haircut and all kinds of things. It's like, wait a minute, that's, that's for me to decide. Um, <clears throat> intimacy can include lowering the net some, but only for those trusted and safe relationships in our lives. So we can lower that net, but in the circumstances in which we have trust and respect going on between the two of us. If we don't, my net is up. And in fact, the more disrespectful, the more blaming and shaming they are, the higher the net goes between me and them, emotionally. Um, because they are wanting to define me. Don't give away ownership of your decisions. Own your own decisions, good or bad. I remember I, I uh, filed for bankruptcy way back in the 1980s. And, and I did feel some shame over that. It was difficult. I felt guilt. I felt, um, and it, it was hard. And, and there were some people that thought I was wrong for doing that. Well, you should have just paid off all those debts. When actually I did pay off a good number of them, even after bankruptcy. The, um, but you, uh, you shouldn't file bankruptcy. That's not a good thing to do. Well, duh. I know bankruptcy is not a good thing to do. However, when there are no other options and no other choices, then sometimes we land ourselves or we have some failure in business or whatever. We There's not a lot of remaining options that are available. And, um, and so, yes, I could have not filed bankruptcy, but that could have been worse than the bankruptcy itself. So, shoulds to coulds. Don't give away ownership of your decisions. Remember, decisions about your life are for you to make and not others. When they say, well, you shouldn't have, you shouldn't have uh, filed for bankruptcy, Jerry. Well, I, I didn't know you were deciding that for me. Uh, and you weren't around at that time to give me all of the good counsel you're giving me now, I say in a playful way. Simply put, Jerry, you're making a bad decision. Or you made a bad decision. Well, how do you know I made a bad decision? We didn't even know each other then. And what tells you that I made a bad decision? Have you asked me what has gone into my decision making? Many times other assume, others assume your thinking process. They may not know all that was going on for me. Fears, trauma, triggers, um, and, and limited and scarcity choices that I was facing. So they don't know all that. They're just going, well, I'm painting the, the broad, with a broad brush and going, well, you shouldn't have done that. Um, 
And, you know, we can also go, well, so what? I'm not the first person to make that decision. I'm not the first person who's ever filed bankruptcy. Um, it, and it certainly wasn't. Same, many times uh, people will feel lots of shame and guilt over divorce, for example. And as I've worked with people who have struggled with the difficult decisions about divorce, how painful and difficult it is. I don't have people coming in going, oh, well, I'd like to change wives today. I'd like to change husbands today. That just sounds like a great thing to do. Usually it involves lots of pain, decision-making, heartache, all kinds of things before they come to that decision. Uh, and so I like to give them that benefit of the doubt. Also, it's not for me to decide whether they should do that or not. Only I can decide that for myself. An additional point, you are not their burden carrier. You are not others' burden carrier. If others or someone else is upset about something that is within your adult right to do or decide, it's not your job or my job to make them feel good or better about it. You do not have to carry their burden of upsetness. Just like if somebody says, well, I'd never file bankruptcy. Why did you do that? That's pretty upsetting that you just took a cheap way out of, of whatever. It's like, it's not my burden to make you feel better about my bankruptcy decision. You're going to have to work on feeling better about it or not. That's up to you. But I don't have to make you feel better about it. I really don't. Uh, like, well, I'm choosing this person to marry. And let's say your parents are just so opposed to that. It, it's, it's, you're not my burden to carry. This is who I'm choosing. I'm sorry you're upset about it. That's something you'll have to work through. This is who I want to marry. It's not my job to make it all okay for you. That's your job. That's the adult's job. And that's what we do. Do you think I've ever had a friend who married somebody I thought it would be an awful marriage? And I've been wrong before, too. I want you to know that. And I've been right. But the thing is, it's not mine to decide. You know, if they ask me an opinion or if they want my counsel, then of course. If they don't, it's not mine to decide or to go and tell them, you better not do this, this is going to be terrible. Many times when people have already gotten to that point, it doesn't matter what you say. They're just going to have to learn from going through the experience. Uh, saving others is, is a difficult thing to do. And from a, a person who spent a long time trying to save others, I know how difficult that can be. You are not their burden carrier. You are not their child. They are not your creator. We used to have a saying when I was pastoring in a church, maybe some of you recall, you know, God loves you and has a plan for your life. We changed it to playfully, they love you and they have a plan for your life. Well, it sounds like they love you and they have a plan for your life. And they're playing God or they're playing creator because they know best what you should be doing. Uh, and we would say that many times. Or, I love you and I have a plan for your life. And then we would joke about that. Uh, because I'd say, well, you guys shouldn't be doing that. And i go, oh, I guess I love you and I have a plan for your life. Uh, I'm taking, I'm stepping over the tennis net over to your side. And I shouldn't be over there. I've heard Edwin Friedman say to someone who is defining him, Edwin Friedman being the marriage and family therapist, uh, theologian, uh, rabbi, uh, who's a great author and a great uh, marriage and family um, theoretician uh, and Bowen follower. Uh, he said, um, he says to someone who is defining him, you know, I hear what you're saying. Now let me check with the boss. And I think that's a much better approach than, well, you're not the boss of me. 
That's more reactive. His was, oh, I hear what you're saying, but I'll check with the boss. And who is the boss? Me. I'm the boss. You're not the boss. Well, you shouldn't buy that car, Jerry. Huh, well, I hear what you're saying. Maybe I have, maybe I have some good reasons for that, but, but I'll check with the boss. Me, I get to decide it. I'm paying for it. I gotta, I gotta finance it. It's, it's for me to decide. Stop focusing on their purpose for you. Focus on your own purpose and direction. Here's an important point as well. Remember, don't let people lift you up. You are not your successes or your talents. You are a being, not a doing. Don't absorb the negative or the positive. Janelle Monet, M-O-N-A-E, writes, don't get high off praises and don't get too low on critiques. And she's right. If you want to work on not getting low on negative messages, work on not getting high on positive ones or overly positive praises. You are not your work. You are not your parenting. You are not your relationships. You are you. Now I want to share a few examples that might be of help to you and maybe some responses. When when anxiety is relatively low, relatively, it can be up a sum, and you're not dealing with the malignant narcissist, I'm not saying these are the responses you want to do, though some people have enough in their relationship where they could even do this to a narcissist, but I'm not recommending that. I would say this is for just good old neurotic, dysfunctional people around you. Uh, versus the malignant narcissist, let's say. Uh, because many times people say, well, I wouldn't do that if I wouldn't say that to a narcissist. And I'm saying, well, then don't. You know, I'm not telling anybody to use my examples in an unhealthy way. When someone says, you are lazy. I might respond, it, it sounds like I'm living up to your expectations. Or I think it's more important than I be that I be lazy, so you have something to complain about. So maybe I should be more lazy. You are stupid. Well, I don't think you realize how hard it is to be unstupid. I'm not stupid. I only act that way at times. Or yeah, I know. We all are. Now let's talk about the upside of the fantasy sides that people will also convey to us. Oh, you're my muse. I hope not. I'll lead you in some, into some very crazy places. Well, gosh, I didn't know you needed one, Mary. Because I don't want to be someone's fantasy or dream. Or, you're the only one that keeps me alive. Oh boy. Then we're both in trouble. Keeping me alive is my job. Keeping you alive is your job. So I don't want to take in the high praise. I don't want to take in the negativity. You're such a helpful and good daughter. And many of us might fall for that. Uh, because then, oh good, finally somebody gives me approval. No. Well, Dad, you know, I, I doubt that. It's just me. And gosh, Mom, sometimes I'm good, sometimes I'm not. Well, you're such a helpful and good daughter. I'm just Jane, Dad, and I wanted to be of help. Or I was glad I could be of help. I want to matter-of-fact it 
and not fall for the praises and go, finally, I get a little drop of water for who I am as a person. No, I don't need that, and I don't need the negative. There are people who have said to me several times, and I, and I know many of them are playful and being playful, and I'll, I'll be playful back with them too. So I don't take everything, anything too seriously. But, oh, Jerry, I wish I would have had you for a dad. Oh my, you, you probably would be worse off than you are now. Oh, Jerry, I wish you, I'd have had you for a dad. You'd really need therapy if that had happened. Or a kind of perplex, perplexing kind of one. Jerry, I wish I would have had you for a dad because you're so fabulous. No, you wouldn't. I snore. We don't want to get caught in others' negativity about us and their fantasies about us. Neither one. Become determined to like and love yourself. Then it won't matter whether others like or love you. I hope you'll please subscribe, join, like, and comment. You can also donate on my website to, to uh, help me keep these posts for more videos on here. I want to thank you all for joining me today. Have a great day and be wise.